אי חג, ישבה בדד. Twice over Shabbat, we read in most synagogues around the world, Eicha was said in relation to Moshe that he felt alone. Alas, I am alone. Eicha, that we're about to read in a few days' time, Yerushalayim, alas, is alone. Of course, most people relate to the Eicha that stirs the heart. But that third word in both lines, being alone, is also very significant. Moshe felt alone. And he wanted and he needed others to support him, to be around him, whether it be the Shivim Zkenim, whether it be the heads, the princes, whoever it may have been, he needed others and he called out for that help. Yerushalayim became in form like a, like a harlot, it says. The great Kiryat Ne'emana lost its glory, its splendor, and it was calling out for her people. For thousands of years, calling out, didn't want to be alone anymore. And maybe that's one of the messages of Tisha B'Av, that Yerushalayim doesn't want to feel alone, feel left out without her people being close to her, feeling for her, supporting her in whatever way possible. My name is Daniel Luria, and as you can see from uh, the Kotel around me, I'm standing here at the Kotel Amaravi, not in Harabait, we're still not there yet. And, and yes, there is still plenty to cry for and mourn in relation to Harabait. But I am standing in Yerushalayim at the Kotel a few days before Tisha B'Av with maybe just a few thoughts and messages for those of you who are sitting in your dining rooms, in your lounge rooms, wherever you're sitting on Tisha B'Av fasting, this year is a very different year. We have the Corona, we have isolation, we have separation. Uh, we actually in many ways feel the destruction of our own lives. So one of the thoughts of Tisha B'Av is this concept of loneliness, of not being, not being alone. Yerushalayim not being alone, and each individual feeling part of the other. When many of us think of Tisha B'Av and the messages and what we should be feeling on this day, we straight away jump to the destruction of the Bet Amigdash. And there's no question that the destruction of the Bet Amigdash, the first and the second, first by the Babylonians, the second by the Romans, is a mainstay or a pivotal point of this national day of calamities and tragedies. But throughout history, as we know, there's been many other things, whether it be the Spanish Inquisition, a host of pogroms and riots, uh, whether it be even in the last 15 years, the destruction of uh, uh, 25 communities in the Gaza Strip, in Gush Katif, and 10,000 people's lives being destroyed. There's plenty to cry about over the years, but it seems that the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash, Chorban Bet HaMikdash in Hebrew, is something that grabs our attention. And when people do that, they straight away say, oh, there was sinat chinam, there was senseless hatred in that period of time. And we'll get to that a little bit later, about one of the famous stories that related to sinat chinam, senseless hatred. There was also a lot of people didn't act with common sense. And what we have to do in order to reverse what took place was we have to show ahavat chinam and caring and common decency and courtesy to the other. And clearly that is true no matter what period, whether it be Tisha B'Av, the three weeks, the, the week of Tisha B'Av, or otherwise. Common sense, decency, and ahavat chinam, senseless love, or love without true reason, just free love, is and care for the other, is something which is central to the Jewish way of life. But I was thinking recently after hearing various different rabbis speak over the, uh, the last week, that maybe we should actually go back even further than the Bet Amikdash. Yes, the Bet Amikdash first and the second is, is central and critical for us to understand what is this day. And we should be crying. The fact that we don't cry enough the Bet Amikdash means we don't understand what the Bet Amikdash was. We don't understand the influence, the impact on our spiritual lives. And that's also true. But someone mentioned to me recently that maybe we should be going back even further. I mean, the Bet Amikdash, the temple, wasn't the first thing that happened on Tisha B'Av. What was the original sin? What was the original cause to make Tisha B'Av this day that became throughout whole of history a day of national calamities and tragedies? That day, as many of you may know, was the day that the spies came back from spending 40 days in the beautiful land of Israel. Yes, they came back with, uh, uh, with grapes and olives and pomegranates, the seven species, they came with a glorious report. It's a beautiful land, but but, Ephes, we are nothing. We are grasshoppers. We cannot defeat them. Who are we? We have no potential. Lack of emunah Hashem, 
and they didn't want to go into Eretz. They didn't want Yerushalayim. They didn't want the land of Israel. They didn't want to have God being realized and felt in the Beramigdash in Yerushalayim. They didn't want that. They saw themselves as nothing and they just wanted to go either back to Egypt or stay in the desert. Everything on a silver platter. They didn't want to work hard for Yerushalayim and for the land of Israel. Because of that, they were first of all punished. That generation stayed in the desert for 40 years. And God says, and this is brought down in many different sources, many commentators. God says that because you, the Jewish people, we cried for nothing on that day, this period, this day will be a day where you will cry for other reasons that will not be in vain. And yes, there were the two temples and the Spanish Inquisition and the pogroms, and the riots. Even the First World War started on, uh, on Tisha B'Av and that ultimately led to the Second World War. And we know what that means. So that original sin, that original problem was actually not the Bet Amikdash, was actually back with the Meraglim, the spies. And therefore, in order to truly reverse it, yes, I'm not saying that Avat Chinam, who am I to say, that Avat Chinam shouldn't, of course it has to be there. But the other thing that has to be rectified is our love for Eretz Israel, our love for the State of Israel, our love for the Yerushalayim, and having to desire every stone, every bit of dust, and want to be here to live, to love, to care, to support, whatever it may be, Yerushalayim and Eretz Israel, because they didn't do it then, and that's the only way to reverse it today. And what better place to talk to you about that than right here? I'm not just standing in front of the Kotel, but I'm standing in front of a mound of stones that came crashing down here when the Romans destroyed the Beit Hamikdash, the temple, in the year 70. We dug down underneath 12 meters of dirt through various conquerors that have been here till we came down to the ground level, the original road that my great-great-grandparents walked on this road. It was the only road, the main road along the whole of the Western Wall. The marketplace could be seen, crashed shops along the marketplace. And the cornerstone was also found. Anyone who hasn't been to the Southern Excavation on your next visit, hopefully it'll be short, won't be in such a long time, come to the Southern Excavations, something very special. The cornerstone of the Beit Amigdash was found embedded in the road. What was that cornerstone? Something we know from the Mishnah. The house of blowing. Every Friday, there would be someone that would go to the corner where it was called the house of blowing and blow six blasts to let people know that Shabbat was coming. There'd be three blasts to let the people in the fields would come in. Then another one, another two blasts to tell the shopkeepers to close down. And then another blast to say that Shabbos is imminent. That was called the house of blowing. Embedded in this road, when we dug away and came to the original road, was a cornerstone that had written on it, Bet Hatzkiah, the house of blowing, that differentiated between, and then it was lost. Between maybe holy and unholy, between the weekday and Sabbath, no one really knows what was written there but it came to life. It's not just an empty road today. This is not just a mound of stones. This actually is the symbol of the destruction. But what's beautiful about it in my eyes is that yours truly is speaking about the building, the construction, is building about the revival of Jewish life from the same place that is a symbol of the Romans laughing and destroying and burning the Bet Amikdash. Because 2,000 years later, I'm the one standing here. I came on wings of eagles, as did many others, and I'm standing in the state of Israel. Maybe more about that later when I'm standing in front of the Churva. Anyway, that's some of the messages that I wanted to give across from this particular point. Maybe from our next stop, I'll take you into the old Jewish quarter. If we're talking about the revival of Jewish life, then maybe we should see it even today. And I'll take you to a rooftop that will look down onto the Temple Mount. We'll see about the temple itself. Maybe there we'll talk about a very, very famous story that many of you know about. But I'll add a few questions to the story of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa. Bar, of course, being the son of. So a father and son that maybe don't get along. One was loved and one was not loved by a person that was having a big event and a function where he invited everyone in the heart of Jerusalem. More of that story a bit later from the top of one of our special buildings called the House of the Photographer.
that's Alam. Why it's called the house of the photographer? You'll have to come on one of the Aterat uh, Quanim tours to actually, uh, on a regular day, to understand what is the true story behind it. But as you can see, even just the view from here, photographers love it. Uh, from this rooftop of one of the buildings in the old Jewish quarter that has been renewed today. One of the messages, of course, of, uh, of Tisha B'Av is the fact that today we actually have seen the revival of Jewish life and we have reversed in some way the, the death, the destruction, the, uh, what Mark Twain saw that there was nothing here, the fact that there's now a thousand Jews living in the old Jewish quarter and the work of Atenekonin is obviously part of that. Uh, I'm here with, uh, with David. Um, on the top of Bet Salam, looking down over the whole of uh, Har Habayit, the whole of the Temple Mount, the Jewish Quarter, the Old City. It's one of the more magnificent places that, uh, under the auspices of Ateret Kurim. Today, of course, we have even a higher building called the House of the View, uh, but that for another time. Um, before we get into the story that I mentioned earlier about Kamsa and Bar Kamsa, uh, that is, uh, I guess, one of the more symbolic stories about behind the concept of senseless hatred and not acting with common sense. Um, I thought we'd just share with you maybe a few thoughts about the, the temple, the Betamigdash. And if you get closer to here, you'll be actually even able to see what maybe Abraham, Abraham Avinu, would have seen 3,800 years ago when he came from uh, Beersheba via Hebron all the way to Yerushalayim and he saw the Temple Mount, Mount Moriah. This Mount Moriah is where everything has taken place in the whole of history, at least Jewish history, the creation of the world, Adam and Eve from the dust on the, the Temple Mount itself. Um, Cain and Abel had their disagreement here on this Mount Moriah. Noah sacrifices here, Akedat Yitzchak, the attempted sacrifice of Isaac. Of course, eventually, uh, not long after, but about 3,000 years ago, after King David prepared the groundwork and buys Jerusalem, redeems it with money, uh, which is an interesting concept. Uh, in many ways, Atarot Kone maybe is the, uh, the uh, following the footsteps of King David who bought Jerusalem from the Jebusites. But he prepared the groundwork and it was his son Solomon who ended up building on exactly the same place of Mount Moriah, the Bet Amigdash. David, you're... Uh, the temple no longer exists today. We are uh, 2,000 years after the destruction and that doesn't exist. And we are commemorating in some ways the fact that it doesn't exist. I think it's uh, the, the temple, it's really better us here. You know, like, it's very, very hard to, it's very hard to, to quantify what it means because we've been away from it so long. And I always, I always think that, you know, it's all kind of, I hate to say it in our heads a bit, you know, look at this, it's right there. I mean, how we perceive how we perceive, how we perceive, how, how we perceive it in the sense that we've come home and so many of us don't realize we've come home. In many, in many ways, maybe we're stuck. It's, you're right, it's a perception. Maybe we're still stuck in a certain way in the shtetl and the ghetto because we have the, uh, the golden dome today, because this is a situation, we don't even see the kotel from here. This is all covered up. This is only via the kotel tunnels. All the houses have been built in the valley covering up and we only see one small section of the western wall. The rest of it is actually underground. But in our minds, we're still in the ghetto That's and the shtetl. That's right. And, you know, there's this yearning of finding the divine presence. And we sort of, we kind of, I feel we've kind of gotten detoured. Maybe that's what Tisha B'Av really is about. It's about being detoured. Like we're right here. We're here, but we're not we're here. Right here. And because inside of us, in that like, inner sanctum of our hearts, which is really what this lines up to. And that's what we're, we're, we're told. And the inner parts of the Torah, that's the heart is the, the Beit HaMikdash. The, 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 the body is Eretz Yisrael. And so we, we have everything, but we, we don't have the whole thing. And we sort of, we're sort of this tension kind of, you know, inside of us. And really it's up to us. There's nothing more we, anything can be done except for us. So we have to more internalize maybe also what that meant. I mean, today, listen, we have in Israel today, as opposed to the shtetl, uh, we may have the shtetl mentality, but we're not physically in the shtetl. That's right. That's right. See, because opposed to the shtetl and the ghettos, we do have a state of Israel. There's an army, there's technology, there's success. We're a, a giant in the eyes of the world. We're a light to the nations. But we're still mourning on Tisha B'Av right. because we don't, maybe even don't even appreciate what that was, you know, how did it impact our spiritual lives? But we still have to, I, I'm still, in many ways, you know, we, it can't be the same way as when we're in exile. No, it's certainly not. It, know, it, it's, uh, I mean, just take this view, it's amazing, right? You turn around this entire view, and a 360, those are those people who can, you know, come on tour and be, be up here, right. really get this sense that, um, 
everything around us is underneath our sovereignty. We're standing on this spot. So we are sovereignty with Rambam. Isn't that the Rambam yeah. we spoke earlier? The, yeah. the Rambam talks about not being under the, the hold of the nations, right. being a sovereign state. Now, is that only in the mind or is it in reality? Do we feel that we're still scared of what the Goyim, what the non-Jewish world would say? Because uh, we definitely have a physical state. The question exactly. is, how do, we, how do we relate to that physical state? Right. But a, there's this 360 view and all of a sudden you come to here and it's missing something. You know, that's, what I, that's the way I look at it. There's just, wow, we're, we literally have sovereignty in 360 degrees. Well, a question for all those who are listening to us today, you know, is the temple, is the Bet Amigdash going to be something that will come down from the heavens? Is it something that we are going to initiate? Are we going to build it? Is it a combination of both when the Mashiach comes? You know, we're, we're, there's no question today that we're in, I don't know, some people call it the footsteps of the, the heels of the Mashiach. Many things have happened that didn't happen when the greats of Jewish history, when the Talmudic scholars were sitting in Babylon, they did not see and, and, and merit what we have today. Uh, there's no question we've gone a long, day, long, long way down the path. I mentioned earlier when I was at the Southern Excavations uh, that you no doubt know about the famous story of, uh, of Kamsa and Barat Kamsa. I think there's actually two stories that we'd like to say here before we finish off at the Kotzla Katan. Uh, one is about Rabbi Akiva and the second one, Kamsa and Bar Kamsa. It seems that in Yerushalayim, and I apologize for many of you who maybe know this story, um, there was a gentleman whose name we don't really know, he's not mentioned directly. Uh, wants to have a very big function in Yerushalayim and he's obviously a very, he was a dignitary, well known because all the great rabbis and the, the heads of the Sanhedrin were there uh, and he had someone that he loved who was called Kamsa and someone he didn't quite uh, enjoy the company of and that was Bar Kamsa. I read something interesting, the Bar Kamsa Kamsa, father and son, that this particular gentleman loved the father but didn't like the son. What did that mean about the father and son? Did one stray from the other? Were they at loggerheads with each other within the family unit? Who really were this Kamsa and Bar Kamsa? Anyway, he tells his servant to, um, to go and invite Kamsa, but the servant uh, makes a mistake and he ends up inviting Bar Kamsa. Now, something that comes out of this is the person who received the invitation must be thinking, wow, the guy wants to forgive me because he's inviting me to this very special function. So he is thinking, wow, this is good. I obviously have to repay him or be very thankful or something or other when I turn up to this particular function. We don't see that he does that whatsoever. So common sense isn't, isn't playing here. Anyway, so Bar Kamsa turns up and when the, uh, the head of the festivity sees that his enemy is there, he goes up to him and embarrasses him publicly and says, get out of here, I don't want you here. And he says, please, 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 you know, I'll, I'll pay for my own meal. He then says, I'll pay for half, the, whatever the whole function is, I'll pay for the whole lot. Common sense doesn't even take place here. Think about it. If someone, even if you hate it, we're going to pay for the whole thing, use it, take it. Not even that, the hatred was so great. And of course, one thing led to the other and he goes to the, uh, the uh, Roman governors and about sacrifices and says that the Jews will never accept your sacrifices. He uh, makes it uh, um, not, uh, not kosher to be sacrificed. And then of course, the Romans get angry and the upshot of his ultimately the temple is destroyed. Now, whether this actually happened or not, uh, not sure, but it's symbolic clearly of problems within the family unit, divisions within the people, hatred, and the thing that bothers a lot of commentators is the rabbis. That's right. That's right. The people who were yeah, at, the party, yeah. at the party and theoretically could have stood up and said something, but actually didn't do anything. You know, there were very few rabbis at the time who understood what had to be for Am Yisrael. One of them was Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, and if it wasn't for him and what he managed to do, uh, who knows what type of Jewish Torah life there would be today. But Yavna, Chachameha, the wise men, the Sanhedrin, and Jewish life as we know it today was ultimately saved. So, yes, there is that concept of not acting with decency, uh, senseless hatred, but I still come back to this idea, I can't get out of it. You know, I'm the one standing here in Israel today and we have to look at Tisha B'Av in a slightly different fashion. I mean, Rabbi Akiva, what's the famous story with Rabbi Akiva with the... Uh... He's on Har Payat and everybody else is sad. He's, they see a fox come out, he, he's laughing. How could you laugh? He's laughing. It's, he's the prophecy. If that prophecy can come true, the rest of the prophecies come true. Because they were pessimistic. Because they were thinking of the negative ones, but he was thinking of the positive ones. That's right. I mean, it comes down to Emunah. It's simple faith. faith. Right. Simple faith because at the end of the day, everything we've seen in this Geula process that's been going for the last 200 years and, and the stuff we're involved with the Tarot Kornim is about simple faith. Pioneers in the most craziest places. Craziest places. Oh, how do you do that? Isn't it dangerous? It's unsafe. And meanwhile, Jewish life is returning. Jewish life, the hand of God is pushing everything forward. 
and, and we see the rest of the world. They probably said the same thing about the Hashmonaim, a small group of Michiganers, uh, mm -hmm. crazy people going out against the greatest empire in the world, the civilization with culture and everything possible. And ultimately, uh, there was, it didn't made, made not have lasted for, you know, thousands of years, lasted for a few hundred years. But the, uh, they were ultimately successful, the small band. And every generation, there are people that are able to, to bring God down in, in, in a way to actually help, you know, God have his reason for moving the process forward. And we have seen that. We are seeing this revival of Jewish life and therefore Tisha B'Av, maybe there are different messages that we have to learn. Yes, we have to appreciate the better Migdash more. Yes, there has to be uh, love and not, not hatred. Uh, yes, there has to be common sense and decency. But at the same time, we have to remember that first uh, sin and we have to uh, show love and appreciation for what we have today, realize those changes and support whatever needs to be done here to keep uh, Yerushalayim so that ultimately this won't be a picture on the, uh, the house, the photographer, but uh, it will be something different. We have to respect what is, what is there, have to understand that uh, there is something else that has been there for X number of years, uh, since seven, year 700 when Abed el Malik built it, uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't pray fast and believe, dream and know that one day the Bet Amidash will be built with the right behaviour of Am Yisrael. We must have done something right because we have what we have today. So we're moving along the right direction. Who knows, maybe a million American Jews and Brazilian Jews and French Jews will be coming to Israel, whether it be because of Corona or other things happening in their own countries, where God is sending more and more messages, wake up. Don't live the sin of the spies. Don't live overseas. Don't believe that your Dalit Amos can, has to be in Chutzlaret. Come where it means something at another level altogether. Maybe, maybe. There are lots of questions and we hope you're asking these questions. Let's go. One of my grandparents would commemorate Tisha B'Av in Tbilisi. On the other side, Lodge, or somewhere outside of Warsaw. It was like all over the place, but somewhere in Europe. All of you watching this today, we all have great grandparents that no doubt sat in the shtetl and also even in the ghettos and we could cry because there was no Yisrael, there was no Yerushalayim, definitely no Bet Amigdash. Where are we today? Today, is it the same story? Today it's a, a whole new ball game. And I'm not just saying from the Balfour Declaration, the United Nations Declaration, there is a sovereign state of Israel today. The Churva that was a symbol of destruction is today totally rebuilt and full of tfilot, of prayers. There are kids running around the streets of Yerushalayim like the prophets said, like Zacharias specifically said. There will be a day where young and old will walk the streets of Jerusalem and play in the alleyways of Jerusalem. We're seeing that today. So how can we still try and relate in some format given the huge changes since 1948 and definitely since 67 when we came back to Yerushalayim? How do we relate specifically and commemorate Tisha B'Av? How many of us have been wearing these masks in the last few days or even weeks? I think all of us are looking forward to the day that we want to get back to some type of normality. We miss the days of normality. We miss the days of social interaction, of freely going to the gym or anywhere else. There's a certain longing even, you know, six months I haven't been walking around Yerushalayim. Seven months I haven't gone out for a coffee. I can't even learn and go to Shurim like I used to. In Davani, everything's different. I look forward, I yearn for that day. Maybe that's the way we should be feeling also in relation to the Bet Amigdash, a yearning of something which is lost. And there's no question we don't have the Bet Amigdash today and we have to understand what that means. What did it give us? How did we feel as a people when we were close to Hashem, when we could see the miracles? We were inspired by the Kohanim and the Levi'im. All that is true. But at the same time, you can see what's behind me. You can see that I am standing in front of the Churva, which was the symbol of destruction today rebuilt. I'm standing in the Jewish quarter, the new Jewish quarter. I'm standing in the old city with a police station here in the old city. I'm standing in United Jerusalem in the State of Israel. Can we deny there's no sovereignty? We are a State of Israel. There's an army, technological giant. What have we got today? 
and therefore maybe we should be thinking differently about the messages of Tisha B'Av. What should we be focusing on? Definitely thinking about it differently from maybe years gone by before the State of Israel, before 1948, and definitely before 67, when Jerusalem came back to the, to the hold of Am Yisrael. These are questions that all of us, myself and everyone watching this on Tisha B'Av, we should be asking ourselves. But take a look and then understand the issues that should be running through your head as you are fasting and as I will be in a few days time. going to finish off our little uh, get-together, walk around the old city with a few messages uh, on Tisha B'Av, and I thought the, the most appropriate place to finish off, because we can't finish, like I said before, on Har Abayit, is to finish off at the Kotla Katan. Um, many of you may be familiar with the fact that the Western Wall, the Kotel, is 488 metres. Yes, we're only at an outer retaining wall, that is true. Most of it's underground, and that's why people sometimes have done the Kotel Tunnel tours. And there's a section of the Western Wall that most people are familiar with called the Kotel. But there is another part of the Western Wall which is also open to the air, open to the air, exactly like the Western Wall where people stand, but it's physically located in the old Jewish quarter. This is the Kotel Akatan, the small Western Wall. In fact, for many people who think that depending on where you stand in the Western Wall, you are closer and is holier than another place, as we know that there are various levels of holiness. Obviously, being in Tel Aviv is one level and being in Yerushalayim is another level altogether. But being inside the Old City, as opposed to outside the Old City, another level. The Temple Mount, close to the Temple Mount, is another level altogether. Maybe even depending on where you stand along the Western Wall, you see this position of the Western Wall is even closer to the place of the Holy of Holies, where the Golden Dome is today, the place of the Beramidash, the Temple, it's even closer. But of course, in the times of the Temple, 2,000 years ago, there was a main road along here, there were shops, there was no treatment of the Western Wall like we treat it today. In many ways, we've turned our focus away from the, from the Temple Mount, and it's all today about Kotel, Kotel, Kotel. Yes, and of course it's important. It's the, uh, God's presence doesn't move from the west, whether it be the western side of the Temple Mount, whether it be the western wall. But we should never lose sight of the essence being the temple itself. The priests, the Kohanim, the Levites, the music, the inspiration, the, uh, what it did to the person who came to visit, how he walked around, how he was uplifted spiritually. We're missing that today. We're missing that um, uplifting spiritual moment. We're missing the songs of the Levi'im. We're missing a lot of things. We're actually, we're actually even missing the fact that we don't even know what that feels like. 2,000 years later, after obviously many, many Tisha B'Av sitting and crying, in some ways maybe we've, we've lost that feeling what it was like. And we have to try and regenerate that again. And maybe the way to do that, the yearning for the temple, has to maybe start with the yearning for Israel and Yerushalayim in Jerusalem. As I mentioned earlier in our little walk or talk on Tisha B'Av, if you go back to the original spies, the original sin was, of course, forgetting Israel, you know, being scared, thinking of ourselves that we don't have any potential and not wanting to go to Yerushalayim and not wanting the Beit HaMikdash, not wanting Israel. We have to reverse that today, just like we need to reverse the senseless hatred uh, and turn that into acting decently like human beings, not speaking Lashon HaRa, only make sure that any good comes out of our mouths and uh, showing uh, love to all who were uh, who obviously uh, believe in God, and even those who don't try and do whatever's necessary to uh, bring them home. Anyway, um, it's Tisha B'Av. I'm speaking now a few days beforehand, but uh, uh, you're all fasting. It's the day of Tisha B'Av, maybe in the morning or the afternoon, wherever you are in the world. And there is a, uh, a famous pasuk that we read in the, uh, uh, the Haftarah this week from Yeshayahu. Tzion b'mishpat tifadeh v'shavea b'tzdaka. Zion will be redeemed through justice and those who return through righteousness. We have come back. The nations of the world said it's okay. Balfour Declaration, the League of Nations, United Nations. The world basically cancelled those shvuot, those oaths that maybe kept us bound for many years. 
who have walked and marched along the footsteps of the Mashiach. The redemption process is open and you've seen the revival of Jewish life even today. Yes, by people, uh, the families, the students and organizations like Atzeret Konim bringing back Jewish life to all these places. That's part of the redemption process that has actually reversed some of the negativity of Tisha B'Av because today it's a different Tisha B'Av than the way it was when Rabbi Akiva was looking down onto the destroyed Har Habayit. It's very different from seeing rubble. It's very different from Mark Twain seeing nothing here but deserts and nothing and the grandeur of Jerusalem being lost. We have come a long way along the process and therefore Tisha B'Av has to be a different mindset about where we're going, what we need to do, what we need to change. I hope you've received some of those messages uh, on the talk today, on our tour and talk on Tisha B'Av. Um, I didn't say hello or shalom, it's not appropriate today and I won't say officially goodbye. I will say though um, that for anyone that wants to be involved and learn more about Atzeret Konim and help with the, uh, the Pasuk of Yeshayahu, if we want true redemption, then that takes righteousness and charity and doing whatever is necessary to show true support and love for Yerushalayim and Israel. So I uh, wish you well and I hope it's been a meaningful fast for everyone. Mm -hmm.